And now for one of my favorite topics in chemistry, the types of chemical reactions. Here you will learn about the different types of chemical reactions and be able to distinguish the various chemical reaction types from each other by the end of this video. We get into what the different types of chemical reactions are, I always like to have a little bit of fun here with relaying the chemical reactions to types of relationships, because that's really all the atoms are doing. They are changing out their relationship status on a molecular level. So what I'd like you to do is if you have a paper nearby, scratch paper, whatever, go ahead and draw out what these scenarios would look like. So first scenario, and make sure you number them too. So like number one on your paper, you would draw a half couple breaks up. So draw before and draw after. So my example over there is where you've got, you know, the happy little Twitter pated couple together, all little heart eyes and everything, and they love each other. And then they break up. So then afterwards, they're both like, hmm, I hate your guts. I never want to look at you again. So go ahead and draw whatever scenario you think that would look like. And then a second drawing, label it number two, have a couple that just broke up get back together again. So make sure you show a before and an after of a couple that broke up and now they're gonna get back together again. And side note here, we all know that couple, right? It's like on, off, on, off, on, off. It's like one week they're together, the next day they're not, and it's just, you can't even keep track. Drawing number three, I want you to have a happy couple that has a third wheel friend. Been there, done that myself. So I totally understand you if uh, you've also been in those shoes before. And then the third wheel friend is going to take the place dating one of the individuals from the once happy couple. So definitely not the scenario I've ever personally been privy to, but I have seen this happen to plenty of other people. I am very familiar with what it feels like to be the third wheel, but I was never involved in then jumping in the relationship. Anyways, so draw a happy couple, third wheel friend, and that third wheel friend is gonna come in and split apart the happy couple and date one of them, leaving one of the members from the happy couple all alone in the after scenario. And the fourth is the happy couple goes on a double date. And then what I want you to draw is after they end up switching their dates. So, you know, this one's going out with this one, but now this one's going out with this one by the end of the scenario. That's your drawing number four. Go ahead and pause the video here and draw out those silly stick figure scenarios on your paper because we are going to use them through the lesson. So now that you have your stick figures to reference, let's put some chemistry to those stick figures to make it make more sense. We're gonna use atomic symbols to write out the following reaction. So just like your first drawing, this is what's happening on a molecular level with these atoms. Let's draw this out. The before is gonna be nitrogen triiodide and the after is nitrogen gas and iodine gas. This is going to be testing both your covalent bond drawing skills and your ionic bond drawing skills and how you balance all those molecules together that we've learned in the past as we write out these chemical equations. So to make it easier on ourselves, I've created a few spaces for us to fill in. First, we have nitrogen triiodide. Since it has a tri, we know it must be a covalent molecule. It has a prefix, so we know it has to be covalent. And we know then if it's covalent, that it's gonna be just the nitrogen. Tri means three, so iodide is I and base three. I heard this great joke from a chemist once, and I laughed so hard, I died. So that's our nitrogen triiodide. Next, we have to have nitrogen gas. Nitrogen itself is never going to be alone. It's a diatomic, so we have to write N2. It's gonna pair up together with itself, so it's not lonely. Kind of like when women go to the women's restroom. They never go alone, they always go in pairs. Now we have iodine gas as well. Iodine is another one of those funny ones where it also goes in pairs. It's a diatomic molecule. So it's going to have a base two because you'll never see I alone. It's always gonna pair with itself if it happens to be alone. This is what we call a decomposition reaction. So one chemical compound breaks up into two or more compounds. So in this case, we saw nitrogen triiodide, our one chemical compound, and it's split into nitrogen gas and iodine gas. The general formula that you can think about for this or that you can identify other reactions that are decomposition is A and B stuck together breaks apart into A 
and be a part. So next to your number one drawing that you of course drew initially at this video, please write the word decomposition. That's your decomposition reaction example. So what does this look like? Nitrogen triiodide itself is extremely reactive. Even a fly just gracefully buzzing by would detonate this nitrogen triiodide. So as you can see in the GIF over there, literally that feather barely touches the solid nitrogen triiodide and kabam, it goes boom. And it creates nitrogen gas and iodine gas. So that purple plume of smoke that you see is iodine gas. This is an example of an explosive decomposition reaction. So for this next one, we're moving on to drawing number two, and let's practice writing out this chemical equation. We have magnesium and oxygen react to form the product of magnesium oxide. So let's write this in our little spaces provided. Magnesium is Mg, oxygen is another diatomic, so you're never just gonna see O by itself. It's gonna be O2 react to form, that's what this plus means, and this arrow here is implying the to form part, the product of magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide, magnesium is a metal, oxygen is a non-metal, so we know we have a covalently bonded molecule. We need to write out the charges for each first and make sure they balance. So Mg has a charge of plus two on the periodic table, and oxygen has a charge of minus two. Conveniently, two minus two is zero, so we can just put those two together. This is what we call a synthesis reaction. We have two or more separate chemicals combining to form one single new chemical compound. The general formula for this is exactly opposite of a decomposition. In this case, we have an A plus B, and it could also be plus C or plus D. You could keep going, it's two or more chemicals, but they all combine to form A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C, D. However many parts are present, there's only one new chemical compound after the reaction has taken place. Then you know it must be a synthesis reaction. Please write synthesis next to your drawing number two, where we had the once broken apart couple form and come back together again. So we're going to light this magnesium on fire and show you a synthesis reaction in real time. But before you do that, safety first, always. Oh my gosh, of course I can itch on my eye right now. So little space for experimentation. All right. Now that I have my hair pulled back so I don't catch it on fire, and I have goggles to protect my eyeballs, we can now take a piece of magnesium with my very cost-effective tongs, scientific tongs of course, also useful for pasta, and a lighter. We're gonna light this magnesium ribbon on fire, and with the added heat, it's going to react with the oxygen in the air and create a very bright light, but you won't do it justice through this camera. However, you can get some magnesium strip really cheap online, and I highly recommend you try it, because it's fun. The only thing is, is that if you do this at home, uh, don't look directly at the light, you can go blind. It's literally that bright that you can go blind. So don't look directly at the light. On the camera, you're fine though, you're not gonna go blind. However, I am going to look away because I wanna use my eyes for the rest of my life. All right, here we go. Well, there we go. All right. So I hope you guys can see that, but um, yeah, that's super, super bright. All righty. Woo! Hope that doesn't set off my smoke alarms. All right, so. Now what you can see as the final product is magnesium oxide, MgO, in the pan there. So that is a completely different chemical now. It is no longer magnesium and there's not just oxygen in the air. The two reacted with each other through a synthesis reaction to form magnesium oxide, which you can also buy as a supplement and ingest it. <laughs> I literally almost melted my tongs together. <laughs> Science requires experimentation. Let's move on to our next drawing, drawing number three, and how that relates to chemistry as well, using our atomic symbols. So we're gonna have magnesium and hydrochloric acid reacting to form the products of magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. So let's go ahead and practice writing this out using our atomic symbols and checking ourselves before we wreck ourselves between covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and balancing charges, and all that jazz. So first we have magnesium, that's M and that's a metal. And then we have hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is HCl. Reacts to form, so that's what the arrow implies. The products of magnesium chloride, 
Now, hopefully you're recognizing that magnesium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, so that would be an ionic bond. We need to make sure the charge is balanced. So magnesium has a plus two charge. I got that from the periodic table and chlorine has a minus one charge also from the periodic table. Here I do need to drop and swap. I'm gonna take this two, put it down there, take this one, put it down there. What I end up with is MgCl2. And finally, hydrogen gas. Hydrogen can never just be by itself. It's a diatomic, so we symbolize that as H2. This type of reaction is called a single replacement reaction. That's where one element or one atom type replaces another element or atom type in a compound. The general formula for this is A plus BX results in A now paired with X and B being all alone. All by himself. So this is like drawing number three for you. Write single replacement next to that drawing to help you remember what's going on at a molecular level. This is that whole third wheel scenario. So A was the third wheel and A stole X's heart and left B out in the cold. All right, just as we saw before, this was our lovely equation that we wrote out for the chemical reaction of single replacement. And above me is a video of one of my fellow teacher comrades back in Arizona, miss you Tiffany, shout out to Tiffany, uh, who created this video showing this reaction happening. Because shocker, hydrochloric acid is really hard to just purchase like for home use. So let's take a look at Tiffany making this reaction possible. All right, so what Tiffany's showing here is she's got hydrochloric acid in that beaker and she's putting the strip of magnesium ribbon into it. You can see that it's bubbling, so it's forming that hydrogen gas. That's what the bubbles are. And what you notice is that the magnesium is now completely gone. It's literally dissolved in the hydrochloric acid and become MgCl2, an ionic salt. Moving on to our fourth example from our drawings, we're gonna draw out the following reaction. Potassium iodide and lead to nitrate react to form lead to iodide and potassium nitrate. Hopefully you're noticing that there's a lot going on in this particular chemical equation. We have a lot of ionic bonding going on. There's even a transition metal and there's a polyatomic ion. Whoa, all of it all at once. So we have potassium iodide. I don't know about you guys, but when I see this sign, the only thing I can think is potassium iodide tailors. First, that's K for potassium. Iodide is I, and we need to make sure that those charges balance. If you look back at your periodic table, K has a charge of plus one, and iodine has a charge of minus one. One minus one is zero, so in that one, it's already balanced. Next, we have lead to nitrate. Lead is PB, and here lead is a transition metal, so we have to show the plus two charge from the Roman numerals given. Nitrate eight, eight is a polyatomic ion, that's NO3, and nitrate has an overall charge of minus two. Convenient, two minus two is zero, we don't have to do drop and swap here either. Those two react together to form lead to iodide, so that would still be PB with a plus two charge from those Roman numerals and iodide has a minus one charge. Looks like we're gonna have to drop and swap. Two is gonna go down here, one goes down here, and we end up with PbI2 and potassium nitrate. Potassium again is K with a plus one charge. Nitrate eight, eight is a polyatomic ion. So that's gonna be NO3 overall charge minus two. Looks like we're gonna have to drop and swap these as well. We'll take this two, put it down here, Take this one, put it down here, and we end up with K2, NO3, with a one on the outside, but remember, anytime there's a one, don't show it, you don't need to, but good habit to put your polyatomic ion in parentheses to keep the cookie all together. This is what we call the double replacement reaction. I like to call it the scandalous reaction because it's where two ionic compounds switch partners with each other. So they're swapping out dates, just like you're drawing number four. The general formula for this is A and B, C and D. Well, those react together by the end of the date, by the end of that evening, A decides D is a lot sexier and C decides that B is a lot sexier than their original date and they switch partners. So next to your drawing number four, you should write double replacement. So as you can see from before, K now thinks that the nitrate is a lot sexier than the iodine. So by the end of the date, K, potassium, hooks up with nitrate, and lead, PB, hooks up with iodine. 
they swap partners. And now my friend Tiffany is gonna show you what that reaction actually looks like as well. So what you see is the two separate beakers with potassium iodide and lead nitrate. She mixes the two together and now we have lead iodide in that beaker. So that beaker now has lead iodide as a solid precipitate yellow at the bottom of the beaker. So those are the four main chemical reactions you should be familiar with, but here's a few more. We also have a combustion reaction. So hopefully the thing that comes to your mind when you think of combustion is fire. So like Charmander, Char Char. What three things does a fire need in order for it to burn? So come on all you Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts out there. What are three things that a fire needs to burn? Hopefully you know the first thing a fire needs is fuel. It needs some kind of fuel type, wood, grass, newspaper, propane, it needs fuel. It also needs heat. It needs a heat source in order for it to burn. And it needs oxygen. It needs air. That's why if you put like a pot or a pan or something over a candle, the flame goes away. It needs oxygen to burn. So let's write out a combustion reaction knowing that we always will have to have oxygen present to react with something in order for the combustion to take place. Let's write out this combustion reaction with butane, that's what's in your typical lighters, which is C4H10, reacts with, that's the plus sign, oxygen, to form carbon dioxide and water. So butane, C4H10, reacts with, oxygen is not just O, O is a diatomic, so it needs to have two present, O2, to form, carbon dioxide, CO2, dioxide, hence two oxygen atoms, and water, H2O. So combustion reactions are any time you have a compound containing carbons and hydrogens. So if you see anything that has lots of carbons and hydrogens, like the butane we just had, C4H10, and oxygen, O2, on the left side of the arrow, that's what we call the reactants, and then always creating products on the right side of the arrow showing CO2 and water, then you know you have a combustion reaction. So the general formula that you're looking for here is C some number, H some number, something carbons and hydrogens with O2, oxygen, and that will always, always, always form CO2, carbon dioxide, and water as your products. So here it's a big hint that it's a combustion reaction if you see that CH molecule on the left side of the arrow and you'll always see carbon dioxide and water on the right side of the arrow, the products, if it's a combustion reaction. So here's a really lame demonstration. Sorry, I can't come up with anything better for this, especially at home with uh, limited supplies. But a combustion reaction like butane and oxygen will form carbon dioxide and water. So if I just have a normal lighter, which has the butane fuel in it, the C4H10 molecules, and we add that click and it'll react with the oxygen in the air to form fire. And that reaction will also cause CO2 and water. So coming off of this fire now, if I was to have something that could condense you would see that there would be water forming and condensing on something in the back. Also, you would see heat rising from this, if, if I had better materials and supplies at home for you. You would also see that there would be some gases coming off of it, and that would be your CO2. So there's a reaction occurring between this butane fuel and the oxygen in the air causing water vapor, in this case, and CO2 to form, CO2 gas, which is why you can't see the products because CO2 is in gas form and water is in vapor form, which is also a gas. And the last reaction I want you to know is called a neutralization reaction. What should come to your mind when you think of neutral? Hopefully something like that face, neutral. No reaction, like a noble gas. In chemistry, a neutralization reaction is what occurs between an acid and a base. So separately, an acid can be pretty harmful, and separately, a base can be pretty corrosive and harmful as well. They can cause eye loss, your skin deterioration, you can dissolve metals in acid, as you just saw, an entire piece of magnesium ribbon just dissolved in acid. That's a metal, guys, dissolving in a solution of acid. So acids and bases separately can do a lot of damage, but 
If we put an acid and a base together, they become harmless. They literally react together to form water and a salt. And now I don't mean like a salt, like the water is being beaten up on, not a salt, but water and a salt. So neutralization reaction is a type of double replacement, but the products happen to end up being an ionic compound, a salt, and water every single time. The general formula for this is HA, which is what represents the acid, and then BOH, which is what represents the base, reacting to form BA, which is your salt. As a little trick here, if something starts with an H, it's usually an acid. And if you ever see something that happens to be ionic as well, so that positive and negative charge, metal and non-metal, that's a salt. And all ionic bonds do happen to be salts. Also, if it happens to end in OH, that's typically a base. For example, you can have HCl, that's hydrochloric acid, react with NaOH, sodium hydroxide, that's a base. And when those two react, you end up getting NaCl, which is your table salt, and water. So separately, I would never recommend drinking hydrochloric acid nor sodium hydroxide, but funny enough, you put the two together and you could drink salt water. I don't recommend doing this at home because you'd have to get these perfectly in equal concentrations for each other to make sure that it's completely neutralized before you drink it. Otherwise, you could still be drinking more base or more acid than you would be intending to do. So while I don't have hydrochloric acid at home, I do have vinegar. So vinegar is acetic acid, it is an acid, and yes, by itself, it is pretty dangerous. Don't believe me? Watch my follow-up of a tooth dissolving in vinegar over a year's period, linked in the description below. So vinegar, definitely dangerous, especially to your teeth, actually, the enamel on your teeth. And vinegar is this molecule right there. Also, I do have sodium hydroxide at home. Sodium hydroxide or oven cleaner, like Easy Off, is probably one of the most dangerous chemicals that you can buy um, and keep at home, actually, in my opinion. This stuff is nasty. Not only does it go after your lungs when you spray it in your oven, but even just a drop of this on your skin will literally start melting your skin off. Don't believe me? It's happened to me plenty of times. I don't recommend trying it. It literally gives you hives and rashes as your skin starts to slough off. If you do get this on your skin, you'll notice it gets slippery because your cells are literally dissolving. So yes, separately, quite dangerous chemicals. But essentially what's going to happen when I show you this demonstration is that there's going to be a reaction between the base part, which is the OH, the hydroxide, on sodium hydroxide, with the acid part, which is the H, on the acetic acid. So one of these lone pairs of electrons is gonna grab onto this acidic H and these electrons here are going to shift onto this oxygen there. What we end up with then is Na floating around in water because this bond right here now creates H2O. So now what we have over here is an actual water molecule. We also transferred over one of these full electron pairs from the bond, and now this O has a full negative charge on it. Funny thing is that this also still has a full positive charge on it. So these two are going to be attracted to each other. Hey, that certainly looks like an ionic bond to me between a metal and a non-metal, and a full positive to a full negative charge attraction. So this right here would end up being our salt, and this is our water product for the neutralization reaction. Let's check this out with actual chemistry demonstration. But first, safety. My hair is back, my goggles are on, and I have some universal indicator paper, so pH 1 through 14. pH is a topic we'll talk about much later when we're in an acid-base unit, but for now, I just want you to see what this looks like. So pH paper looks like this and it has a range of colors. This right here that looks funny, that's green because I have a green screen behind me, so it's gonna try and block out that color as well. But what we can see then is if we have a range of pH, so on this side where it's purple and blue, that's more basic. On the other side where it's reddish and orange, that's more acidic. So let me show you the vinegar and the oven cleaner in a beaker so you can see that these pH strips do work and I'm not just pulling your leg. This is my beaker of acid. And that means that this strip should show up a reddish color. Sure enough, that's like a pinky color. You can see that pinky orange reddish color. 
we know that this is in fact an acid. If you created your poinsettia pH test strips from my previous video, linked in the description below, if you wanna know how to create your own at home pH strips using poinsettia flower petals, you can also do the same thing. And you can tell that it's also a ruddy color, reddish pinky color. We know that this is definitely an acid. Two different kinds of pH tests have told us so. Next up we have our base. This is our oven cleaner, that nasty stuff that'll literally take your breath away in a bad way. And now this should show up blue because it's basic. And that's so dark blue that it almost looks black on the camera, but that's definitely blue. So very, very basic. Let's check out with our poinsettia pH strip as well. If you watched my previous video, you know that this should turn black if it's basic. And of course, because it's turning blackish green, you can't see it because of my green screen. It's gonna try and block it out. So the idea here is that I have an acid and a base. Separate, they are destructive. Together, they are neutral. Now, if I put these together, I want to get to a neutral pH. And I can test neutral by around seven, or basically a color of like a light green-ish, which again is gonna not show up on the camera because of the green screen. But let me show you what I need. So I'm gonna pour my acid into my base, try and neutralize it, and create water and a salt. So now if I stick my pH strip in there, it should hopefully be green. Actually, that looks a little bit red to me. So it seems like I've added too much acid. Well, what if I add some more base? All right, now my pH strip is definitely looking a little bit more yellow and green. You can see the green screen starting to freak out about it, but I'm not quite there yet. So I just have to keep adding more base. And I finally end up with a greenish color, which again is not showing up on here because of the green screen. But now I know that this solution is neutralized. So the products that are in there are an aqueous salt, basically a salt dissolved in water. It's salt water now. Cool. So technically this is no longer sodium hydroxide, it is not oven cleaner anymore, and it is no longer acetic acid. It is not vinegar anymore. This is now salt water. So here's a summary of all of the types of reactions that you should know. Decomposition, synthesis, single replacement, double replacement, combustion, and neutralization. Make sure you test yourself before you wreck yourself and go through these questions and see if you can identify the reaction type for each of the reactions shown. If you'd like to know the answers to these test yourself questions, go ahead and post in the comments below and I'll be happy to tell you if you got them right or not. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a quacks up and subscribe for some more educational content. No ducks, no glory.